The Tom Woods Show, episode 569. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, I'm holding a special webinar tomorrow, Thursday, January 14th, 2016, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And we're donating $5 to antiwar.com for every single person who attends the live webinar. Joining us will be the greatest affiliate marketer in the history of the world, Chris Record, and he's going to teach us lead generation, traffic generation, building an email list, making more sales, and how to be successful online. Plus, he's a Ron Paul guy, so what more could you want? Join us by signing up at tomwoods.com slash chris. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the show. We're talking today about humanitarian intervention. This is a very, very commonly heard argument in favor of military involvement in the affairs of other countries. Well, we have to get involved for the sake of helping people who are suffering in one way or another. Maybe they're suffering at the hands of some government or at the hands of some bad people or whatever, and therefore we need military intervention. So it's the kind of argument that libertarians have to wrestle with at one time or another. And joining us to talk about this today is our old friend now, Lori Calhoun, who is a research fellow of the Independent Institute, and she is also the author of a couple of books that are relevant to the discussion. One of them is War and Delusion, and the other is called We Kill Because We Can, From Soldiering to Assassination in the Drone Age. Before I turn to Lori Calhoun, let me tell you a, a programming note here. Let me insert a little note. I had originally intended to run this episode a few episodes down the road, and then an episode came in where the audio quality just was not good enough, and it was a person who was not very technically savvy and wasn't able to use Skype or any other method of recording, and I just came to the conclusion that the audio just wasn't just wasn't up to snuff and there'd be no way I could make use of it. And this kind of threw my whole programming schedule into disarray because there are some episodes that must run on particular days like the upcoming debate analysis episode on Friday and so on. So the show notes page for today is tomwoods.com slash 569. Now in the conversation, I've gone back and re-recorded the introduction part because in the actual conversation I have with Lori Calhoun, I repeatedly say tomwoods.com slash 572. Ignore me when I say that. Don't ignore anything else I say, of course. Listen to everything I say very, very carefully. Accept that. So you'll know, you can snicker when you hear me say that, that the real show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 569. Sorry about that, but this is the easiest way to deal with this unfortunate monkey wrench that's been thrown into the works. All right. Lori Calhoun, welcome back to the show. Hello, Tom. Good morning. Happy New Year. Same to you. We generate a lot of controversy when you and I talk. And last time we talked about just war theory, and boy, did we make some people angry. We said that just war theory has been a failure, and people were very, very unhappy with that, kind of along the lines of telling people, and I don't want to implicate you in this view, but my own view, that the Constitution has been a failure. People say, oh, no, no, no. Why... Woods, you are being impertinent to say that. The problem is that people have interpreted it wrong, but okay. But if it can be so e easily misinterpreted, then it ain't so good. If, if we're resting our liberties on people's interpretations, those interpretations are going to be tendentious, and it's not going to work out. Whereas, as I was mentioning to you before we went on, chess has not been a failure. The rules of chess are set in stone. You don't have 12 different schools of thought on it. You don't have major challenges to it. You don't have people who say, well, I think you should be able to move the pieces according to whatever you think is best for the general welfare, and whatever's best for the general welfare winds up being whatever's good for the white player. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. People just obey the rules of of chess and they're constant and consistent. So I would not say chess has failed, but I would say these other things haven't worked out uh, particularly well. Before we get into our topic for today, is there anything you want to say on that subject that you feel was maybe unsaid or that you might be a response to some of these critics? Let me give you a chance to do that. Sure. Uh, one thing I would say is that the burden of proof about killing, I think, lies with the person who's going to kill. So, so if you want to say that just war theory uh, is a sound framework, you have to 
you, the burden is on you to explain why that is the case. And I, I don't see where that comes from. I mean, I, we talked about this at length before. And I also believe that the premises that were held by Augustine and Aquinas and the other fathers of just war theory are no longer valid in the modern world. I respect those thinkers very much. I think that they were um, excellent intellectuals for their day. I actually believe that they might agree with me if they were alive today, given the changes in the world and the way warfare is carried out. So I don't think, I think that some of the people were angry because they thought we were disrespecting these honorable thinkers from history, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that given, if I believed what those men believed, I might have agreed with them, but I don't believe what those men believe, and I don't believe that most modern people do. So uh, so that's, that's one thing I would say to hopefully um, respond to some of the anger. I also think that it's natural to be angry when someone steps forward and criticizes a framework which has dominated normative thought about war for centuries. It's, it's a natural response. You yourself had that response when you first heard about my Oh, yeah. I wanted to throw it on the floor. I was so angry. I, I just couldn't believe what how, the nerve of some people was the way I thought at that time. That's right. All right. Let's talk about humanitarian intervention. As soon as you suggested this, without even reading your article, I said yes, and then I read it. And so we'll talk about it. We're going to link to it at uh, tomwoods.com slash 572. I want to talk about this because this is, of course, probably the the case of the hard cases. This is the issue that uh, I think people who are inclined to be against war have to address. It's easy to say you shouldn't fight a war for oil or you shouldn't fight a war for this or that imperial advantage. But when there are people being killed by some – you know, under terrible circumstances, it's much harder to make the case that we shouldn't do it because you find yourself saying, well, you know, it could it could become worse if we get involved. And a lot of these arguments seem not that persuasive. So we have to face this head on. Let's start from the very beginning. When we deal with humanitarian intervention, what are the different I mean, I mean basically I, I, I I'm not sure there is a well thought out if there is a, a book or a school of thought that just takes a flat-out op- opposing view. I mean, libertarians take an opposing view of it, but but I don't see like a full-scale moral evaluation of why it's good to stay out even when there are cases – you cite the Rwanda incident uh, or, or the Rwanda case as an example uh, – of, of just horrifying human carnage uh, – Whereas I can think of schools of thought that say you do need to intervene. Utilitarians might say that, for example. I can think of people who would say that whatever losses you and your people might suffer in trying to intervene are surely, surely pale in comparison to the good that we might be able to bring to a, a, a terrible situation. Well, that's the line of the, the humanitarian interventionist. But the first point I would like to make is that the very expression humanitarian intervention is misleading. Because it sounds as though what you want to do is intervene in a humane manner. In reality, as it's been carried out so far in history, and it is a new development in the history of warfare, it means military bombing carried out on behalf of of people who appear to be victimized. So why don't we just call it humanitarian bombing? Well, that sounds like a contradiction in terms, because bombing harms the people under bombing. It terrorizes them, even if they're not going to be killed. Um, But it also can exacerbate an already bad situation, galvanizing the enemy soldiers to fight even more viciously than they were fighting before, as it did in 1999, when more Kosovars were killed by Serbian soldiers after the NATO bombing had commenced than before. So it's, it's, uh, as I said, a new development in history. There are people such as Samantha Power who call themselves humanitarian hawks, and in a way they're acknowledging that what they advocate is bombing. Um, but it's new in that we're not, we're not defending war on the grounds that we need to protect ourselves, as you said. And so it's very seductive to liberals in particular. So many people who oppose the 1991 Gulf War because they thought, oh, it's you know blood for oil, actually lined up behind Clinton to support the 1999 bombing of NATO. Yeah. Now, that's, let's talk about the Kosovo case for a minute. And for listeners, FYI, I have a chapter on the Kosovo matter in my 33 Questions book, so I'll link to that also at 
tomwoods.com slash 572. But there was a case in which, well, first of all, you had Bill Clinton as president. So he was a Democrat that made it easier for liberals to support that intervention. And uh, oddly, there were some conservatives who were against it on the grounds that it it wasn't part of our national interest. I mean, you do still have conservatives who talk that way. Even Sean Hannity, to my recollection, was against that intervention. Uh, I don't look for consistency in the thought of Sean Hannity, but I'm just saying that that's an interesting point. Yes. But there were certainly I'm I I would be willing to stake my reputation uh, on the idea that John McCain favored it because. Well, can I even say the words John McCain opposed the bombing of X? I don't think those words fit together. It's like oil and water. So there were – certainly there – and there were neoconservatives who favored that intervention. And in that case, you had – unlike Rwanda, where the reality was just appallingly bad, here the reality was bad, but it was – grossly exaggerated by propaganda, and only afterward did we find out, oh, the situation was not nearly as bad and was much more complicated than we were led to believe, but now we've already destroyed all their infrastructure and we're on to, their ne- we're on to the next thing now. That's right. In, in fact, all, in all of these cases, the scenarios are much more complex than they're painted to be. The calls for humanitarian intervention invariably involve Context where it's really false and misleading to suggest that these are Manichaean battles between good and evil. But what happens is humanitarian interventionists and warmongers more generally play the Hitler card. And so then suddenly it seems like it's a battle between good and evil. So Slobodan Milosevic is compared to Hitler. Therefore, we have to save the people whom he is victimizing. In reality, these conflicts are always a part of lengthy chronologies through which all sides have been victimizing all sides. And to pretend that time begins at the moment of the latest atrocity is to wrong the people previously wronged who, albeit misguided in their tactics, are often acting what they take to be just retribution. So it's very complicated. We we could compare the case in uh, Syria as well. Super complicated. I mean, that's basically the definition of a quagmire. Um, Or in Libya also. But in some cases, well, okay, well, let's but let's take the cost of the uh, let's take the Rwanda case, because there you have just because it's the hard because it's such a hard case, and you see it by the way. I, did you see that movie Hotel Rwanda? Did you see that movie? I did. Yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's a very interesting movie. I mean, it's very interesting the way that hotel manager is basically trying to hang on to some semblance of normal. You know, human interaction while this horrifying situation is unfolding. But there was a case where, in that movie, the 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 main character is holding out hope that there will be some international intervention that will put put a stop to that. Couldn't people say to you, "Okay, you're a moral philosopher of war, and it's wonderful that we have people who think through the moral implications of all this stuff." But let's face squarely. The fact that you had mass slaughter going on, and it seems highly unlikely that military intervention would make that worse. At the very least, it might, you know, there's at least a chance, a roll of the dice, that it could improve things, given that sitting back and doing nothing is not improving things. So, how can you sit back and say, let's not even try? Because in the past, the military solutions haven't always been effective. Well, sitting here obviously isn't effective. So, why not try? Well, I think that in the case of Rwanda, bombing would not have improved the situation. It probably would have exacerbated the situation as much as it could have been exacerbated, I suppose. But the, you know, the, they were killing people with machetes. They were individual people out there slaughtering people one on one, and it was a very complicated situation. You, you're right that in Hotel Rwanda, they they depict some of the dilemmas. One thing that happened is that the white people were escorted out of the country. And the Africans, the black Africans begging to be taken along were left behind. So that's one way where intervention could have involved transporting these people out of harm's way. And that was not done. I would have favored something like that. I I would not have favored the bombing because I don't think it would have been effective. I mean, you can't bomb every single person with a machete. And when you do, you're going to kill their, their prospective victims anyway. So I don't think bombing would have been effective. But Wanda was definitely... The case uh, that led to the momentum for the whole, quote-unquote, responsibility to protect movement. They even abbreviated this as R2P, which is, I guess, hashtag ready now. So um, the idea was that we have a responsibility to protect. And and these people, um, the humanitarian interventionists, 
very popular among liberal academics, wanted to say that the UN Charter is somewhat faulty in its focus on on the power of authority of war making belonging only to sovereign leaders. So they wanted to say that we need to have a system where states are actually required to intervene when people are being victimized by their own leader. So they wanted to actually expand the horizons for war rather than just being limited by the UN Charter and the provision of the right to wage war to leaders. They wanted to say there, there are cases where we need to intervene on, on behalf of these people who are being victimized. Let's, let's take a let – me, let me give you an example that you use in the, in the article. The, the case of Truman's ato- uh, dropping of the atomic bombs. Now, I would prefer to just do a whole episode on that w- with somebody at some point, and every August I mean to do it, and then the date creeps up on me and I, I don't get it done. But mm-hmm. I, I want to I cover that because it's the classic case of utilitarian theorizing. Mm-hmm. Because and, – and let's not even go into would uh, – you know, would – is it really true that he saved a million lives and whatever? Because that number has been disputed. Uh, but th- what people say is it it ended the war. We all know the war was a terrible thing, and he ended the war by doing this. And if you say, but all these children died in horrific ways, people look at you like you're a moral reprobate. Look, it ended the war, and so far more children would have died. What do you want? Do you want more children or fewer children to die would be the way they would put it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not like that's not – at all compelling. So how do you wrestle with that? Well, I think that utilitarianism is very relevant to the issue of humanitarian intervention because just war theory alone does not suffice for what the humanitarian interventionists want. They want to say that we have a duty to intervene. Just war theory specifies conditions on the permissibility to wage war. So the humanitarian intervention position is actually much more hawkish than the just war theory position. And it's and it needs it needs something else, and that other thing is a, a utilitarian idea. Um, utilitarianism, as you know, was authored by Jeremy Bentham and developed further by John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, and it specifies that the right action is the one which maximizes the utility of the greatest number. It's a very demanding normative theory, because only one action can maximize the outcomes. So according to utilitarianism, there's only one right action, all of the rest are wrong. This means that going to war is either prohibited or it's obligatory. And that's exactly what the humanitarian interventionists want to say. They want to say that war is obligatory. It's not a choice. You actually must go to war, according to them. But at the same time, the, the interventionists want to embrace the just war theories, theorists' view on intention. Okay, intentions matter, according to just war theory. One of the requirements of which is that war be waged with right intention and for a just cause. Presumably, for example, waging a war to distract attention from a domestic political scandal would not qualify as right intention. But the humanitarian interventionists were standing by Clinton with a ready-made cause and noble intention to save people from their evil dictator. What is really curious about humanitarian interventionists is that they only seem intent on the obligatory and very demanding prescriptions of utilitarianism in the buildup to a bombing campaign. Once the bombing has come to an end, they go back to whatever they were doing and forget all about the mess left behind. So a very good recent example of this was the 2011 bombing of Libya. Okay, Obama was persuaded to hit Libya with hundreds of missiles by a group of, I, I suppose it was three, three or four women, Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Samantha Power, possibly Anne-Marie Slaughter, who claimed that if he failed to bomb Libya, then there would be a genocide. So a utilitarian argument. So all that it took was whipping out the G word for Obama to sign off on military action um, while claiming at the same time to the public that it was not really a war since he was not sending any soldiers into harm's way and so he did not need the permission of Congress. So the results were, as we know, Muammar Gaddafi was dead, Libya was in disarray, and what did the humanitarian interventionists say about the hundreds of refugees who drowned while attempting to escape the chaos and insecurity directly caused by the U.S. intervention and removal of the Libyan leader? Nothing. Remarkably, once the bombs have been dropped, the self-styled humanitarians go back to what they're doing and uh, basically adduce the tried and true Rumsfeldian response, stuff happens. So they don't take any responsibility for what happens after the intervention. They, they drop all of their, commit, their, their apparent commitment to utilitarian, the high-minded utilitarian uh, principles after the bombing. 
So I find this all very, very suspicious. I mean, you can't, you can't say both I'm a utilitarian and I'm not a utilitarian. Uh, I'm, only in, I'm only a utilitarian in the run up to the war and then afterwards I'm just gonna forget about what happened. All right, uh, that leads me to, uh, I do want to ask the genocide question in general, because that comes up all the time. Okay. The, the, way, the, the way genocide is used to justify intervention, or just to make a generic moral case for humanitarian intervention, genocide is mentioned. Let's just pause for a quick message, and then we're going to ask you that question. Okay. We talk a lot about the free market on this show, but I love the free market, not just in the abstract, not just as a delivery mechanism that delivers the goods for people, but I love the guts of it too. You know what? I love advertising. I love marketing. I love lead generation. I love traffic generation. I love building email lists. I love the guts of it. That's what makes the market work. And we have a lot of theorizing about entrepreneurship among libertarians, but a lot of times when you talk to them about the guts of it, it's like you're waving garlic in front of Dracula. Walter Block wrote a book called Defending the Undefendable. Well, marketers and advertisers are the undefendable in our day and age, and doggone it, I think they should be defended. They are performing an important social function. Well, anyway, if you feel the way I do, if you see a link between the freedom philosophy and entrepreneurship, and if you, like me, are interested in monetizing the work you do online, even if that work happens to be a labor of love, you still have to feed yourself, then definitely join me at my webinar tomorrow. TomWoods.com slash Chris is how you sign up for it, because we're going to be talking about exactly that. Not to be missed. I've got the best guy there is to talk to us about it. You won't want to miss it. Plus $5 for every single person who's there. We're donating $5 to Antiwar.com. It's awesome. Sign up at TomWoods.com slash Chris. All right, so the genocide question comes up a lot. It certainly comes up in my circles, and I get emails all the time from people saying, well, what would you say about intervening? We all know that it's dumb to intervene to overthrow Middle Eastern dictators. Every single time we do it, it winds up terrible. We get a worse guy, or the situation is worse, or whatever. But if we know, and they'll say, look, we know the U.S. government lies about genocide. They use this word constantly, and it always turns out to be phony baloney. But let's just imagine, just for the sake of argument, that one time in their lives they're telling us the truth, that there really is an ongoing case of genocide. How could you possibly say that intervening to at least try to stop a genocide would be worse than the genocide itself? How could it be worse? Well, that's how it's always painted. It's always doom and gloom. Things are going to be worse if you don't do something. You will have blood on your hands if you don't go stop this dictator. In fact, uh, this position violates all sorts of principles we, we cling to in civil society. One of those is killing versus letting die. We uphold this distinction in civil society. In consistency, we should uphold the same distinction abroad, which implies that we are never responsible for the acts of murder committed by other agents. We are, however, responsible for the direct consequences of our own actions. It does not matter if our military intends only to kill bad guys. They are equally responsible for the innocent people whom they kill whenever and wherever they fire deadly weapons. But what happens during the run-up to a war is people want to just relax this and say suddenly, oh, we don't, we don't hold on to this, pr this principle anymore, killing versus letting die. We now think that letting die is just as bad as killing. And... Uh, Closely related to that is the distinction between negative versus positive rights. Again, this is a, a distinction we uphold within civil society. We deem it wrong to directly cause harm to another person. We do not, however, hold ourselves responsible for the misery of other people caused by themselves or by other agents. Humanitarian interventionists want to say that we have a duty to intervene which arises out of a positive right of the victims to be saved. But such a duty and correlative right cannot be generalized because in a phrase, and this is the most fundamental principle of all, ought implies can. It cannot be the case that we are morally required to do what it is impossible to do. It would be impossible for us to save all of the people of the world currently being victimized. So it cannot be the case that we are morally obligated to do so. And I believe that when humanitarian interventionists start talking in terms of genocide, it's very persuasive because uh, people are are easily swayed to believe that they must join the war effort, otherwise they will somehow be responsible for what happens. 
In fact, it's, it's not true. Even if you accept uh, the just war theory, theorist doctrine of double effect, you are never obligated to go kill people to, to prevent them from being killed by other people. And the, <clears throat> the best way of understanding this I've found is that if you think about the intention of the war opponent or the pacifist, the intention of the pacifist who says, I will not support bombing, is to not kill people. The, int the intention of the pacifist is not to allow a murderous dictator to kill people, it's to not kill people. So it, the very framework that these people um, base their calls to war on, usually just war theory amalgamated with, with some, you know, temporary principle of utilitarianism implies that you do not have a moral obligation to carry out war or to bomb other lands. It doesn't matter what's happening on the ground because it, 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 does, it conflicts with all these other principles that we uphold within civil society. Well, they say, they say that when they are – okay, so in other words, with double effect, they would say it's true that civilians are going to die in these campaigns, but – we are we have a good moral intention and we are not directly intending this unfortunate outcome so our you know the morality of what we're doing is thereby vindicated and so in other words you're saying that there is a an analog to this on the anti-war side which is that i'm not intending any bad thing either That's right. i'm simply intending the not direct killing of anybody and my involvement in the direct killing of anybody that's correct. And I think that if you want to gauge the sincerity, sincerity of these various calls to war, for example, the 1999 bombing of NATO, you have to look at the bombers' views on other matters, for example, weapons exports. So if you really are concerned to prevent the murder of people in these countries, then what you really should support is withholding weapons from them. So don't provide them with, with weapons. Don't arm dictators. But of course, the same people who call for for bombing in these cases are the are the are the ones who are ready and willing to arm everyone. John McCain's a good example, right? Let's just give them all weapons, even though we know from cases such as Saddam Hussein that there's a really good chance that once these people are empowered, they're going to become murderous dictators. But they keep the the weapons keep flowing out to these places, which do not have the industrial capacity in most cases to produce their own weapons of war. And then what happens is predictably people use the weapons. They have the weapons, then they use the weapons. And then suddenly the humanitarian intervention, inter interventionists clamor for war again. They say, we have to stop these people from using the weapons which were provided to them by the international community. My answer is stop spreading these weapons around. You know, you, if you want to have weapons to defend your own borders, fine. But uh, shipping weapons to Bayran, where the people are trying to democratize their land, shipping to weapons to Saudi Arabia, uh, which is now laying to waste Yemen. Uh, that's that's where the humanitarian interventionist, if genuinely concerned with humanity, should be working, in my view. You have a section at the very end of the paper called War Opponents as Long-Range Utilitarians. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Every time you bomb someplace, you are saying that bombing is a sound means to resolve conflict. Every time you intervene militarily, you are serving as an example for smaller groups and other nations to do the same. Good example here again is Libya. You may have noticed that the situation in Syria became much, much worse after the 2011 intervention in Libya. And one reason for that may have been that the rebels on the ground said, hey, maybe we can get the United States to help us out here too, just, just as they did in Libya. So what happens is you get all sorts of um, reactions whenever you bomb of people who are motivated to uh, kill more people faster because they don't know what the future will bring. And also to play this sort of game where you provoke intervention. Okay, so it's arguable that the KLA in 1999 provoked, it must have been 1998, provoked intervention um, by acting in a way that caused Slobodan, Slobodan Milosevic to clamp down and look like this evil dictator at that moment in time. And of course, the international community responded. Um, some people have argued that the same thing happened in Syria, that, that it's possible that the chemical weapons were used by some of the rebels who were hoping that the United States would come to their, to come to their rescue. More, more 
detailed investigations into what happened with the chemical bombing suggest that both sides may have used chemical weapons. But in any event, this provocation strategy has worked many times throughout history. It also ha it also worked in um, in Britain when the IRA provoked the Black and Tans to go out on a killing spree, and the reaction was they well, they killed innocent people then, and that that galvanized support for the IRA cause. So this provocation strategy happens all the time. In terms of the long range um, utilitarian argument, once again, it's just that if you, once you start bombing, you are saying that this is a way to resolve conflict. And we see this with the United States all the time. I mean, Obama expresses concern about these mass shootings in the homeland. I wanna say that some of these people are probably following his example. Right? He is saying with his drone campaign, for example, that this is how you resolve conflict. You go out and kill people. And so from a, the perspective of long-range utilitarianism, um, it actually would be much better for, for, for humanity for us to stop these interventions because then other countries and other groups and other factions would not follow our example. Before I let you go, what did I not get to that's central to the argument? This, this isn't a riddle, by the way. Maybe we did cover everything. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I do think that it's interesting that the the Libyan example uh, involved Hillary Clinton's support for for intervention, and her husband was probably the first one to have supported a uh, humanitarian intervention in 1999. So I find that a little bit interesting, and I also think that it gives us some grounds for hypothesizing what another Clinton administration would be like, especially since she is very fond of saying that you get two for the price of one if you elect me. So we may have more intervention if uh, Clinton is elected as president. Yeah, it's a, it's a very unfortunate uh, situation that's unfolding before us. But on the other hand, uh, and, and, and by the way, even if we had Bernie Sanders, he's been in favor of humanitarian intervention. He voted for the intervention back in 1999. Uh, I just saw some polling data for Hillary that is very, very bad uh, in, in, uh, in both New Hampshire and Iowa. And as a matter of fact, uh, nationally, her numbers are way down mm -hmm. and his are, are shooting up. I think she'll still hold on to it, but I think she's going to be really battered. Uh, at the same time, it's hard to know it's just hard, it's hard to predict these things, but even a battered Hillary, I mean, gosh, she and her husband, they are, they are a, a vicious team. And I, even if I had a really, really strong platform and candidate, I, I would be intimidated going up against them. Yeah, they're a political force to be reckoned with, no doubt about it. I'm glad you brought up Bernie Sanders because he's an example of one of these people who opposed the 1991 Gulf War but supported the 1999 NATO bombing because, you know, they played the Hitler card. Oh, Hitler must be stopped. And so all of these liberals came forward. Bernie Sanders, I think, is gaining favor now because he seems to be more principled than Hillary. Hillary looks like a flip-flopper. She's changing her view on everything depending on the, the opinion polls. But you're right, people are afraid of um, something worse than Hillary. <laughs> so so uh, she's very strengthened by the weak slate on the Republican side. I did, I did recently read that in Hillary's emails, there's some indication that there were these ulterior motives for bombing in, in Libya having to do with, with currency. And I haven't looked into that more, more deeply yet, but it's an interesting case because it just, it, it illustrates what we all know is that when people go to war, there are many different reasons for going to war and many different parties are involved and many, uh, many different rationales, only some of them, which only some of them look to be morally upright. And what happens is whenever there's there's a group of humanitarian humanitarian interventionists ready to support the war cause, that's the pretext that's offered to the populace. Okay, this is why we're really going to war. It's not because NATO needs to have a a reason for continuing to exist after the Cold War. It's not because Bill Clinton wants to divert attention from his sex scandal. No, the reason why we're going to war is this noble reason to save these people from their evil Hitlerian dictator. Um, so it's a very, very seductive line, and people find it nearly irresistible. Of course, some people find it resistible because they believe in the UN Charter position on, on, on the authority of war being accorded only to sovereign leaders of nations. But to liberals, it's super seductive. And that's why you see people who ordinarily oppose war stepping forward to support efforts such as the 1999 bombing of Kosovo by NATO.
All right. Well, as I said, I'm going to link to the article that on which this conversation has been based, Killing, Letting Die, and the Alleged Necessity of Military Intervention. That'll be linked at tomwoods.com slash 572, as will all your stuff, your Twitter and blog. But for people who are never, who are going to break my heart by not visiting tomwoods.com slash 572, why don't you tell them the uh, the address of your blog? Sure. The blog is about the drone book, and it's the droneage.wordpress.com. Also, I should say that the article you're citing is found in an edited version in my book, War and Delusion. It's chapter nine. It's called Bombs and Charity. Okay, we'll make note of that, too. All right, well, as always, thanks for your time. It's great fun talking to you and always enlightening. Thank you so much, Tom. All right, before I tell you what's coming up tomorrow, let me remind you that the show notes page, as I said, is not tomwoods.com slash 572. It's slash 569. So don't listen to what I said in my actual conversation with Lori Calhoun. Also, Remember, sign up for that webinar. I know it's not much notice, but hey, it's the way I roll. You know, I'm a fast-paced kind of guy. Got this webinar coming up tomorrow, Thursday. That's January the 16th, or January, sorry, January the 14th. The number 16 was coming because it's 2016. It's January 14th, Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It's going to be awesome. You're going to learn a ton. I've learned a ton from this guy. It's ridiculous how much I've learned from this guy. So check that out. Plus, he's a Ron Paul guy. I mean, come on. So check it out, tomwoods.com slash chris is how you can sign up. And for every one of you good folks who shows up live for the webinar, we're donating $5 to antiwar.com, so let's give them as much as we can. All right, speaking of anti-war, tomorrow we're going to be talking once again about North Korea and its nuclear capability and the news related to that and how we should think about that subject. Another important question for libertarians to answer uh, nuclear weapons in general, and also in this particular case. So that's going to be a lot of fun, number one, because that's a very interesting and important topic for us to reckon with, but secondly, because guess who is going to be coming back to join us once again as a guest? You guessed it. It is that weasel Michael Malice, but he knows an awful lot about North Korea, so we're going to talk to him. So definitely, definitely, definitely join me for episode 570 tomorrow. We'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.